everyone. Um, I trust you can all hear me. And uh, thank you, Stacey. Um, wow, okay. It's been really fun so far. I enjoyed seeing everyone's dance moves. And um, I don't know about your guys' breakout groups, but I had some great discussion in mine. And I was reading your chat. Looks like you all have some really awesome ideas about what it means to be radical. So thanks for tuning in. I'm really excited to be here. Um, before I really dive in though, I do want to say I told everyone this, um, kind of the team earlier. I first was exposed to Creative Mornings by my friend about five years ago, uh, back when I was still on the East Coast. And this was way well before I had started drag. I didn't know what Creative Mornings was and there wasn't anyone in my city. But my friend goes, I want you to watch this video. You need to follow this YouTube account. They have the best talks. And she sends me this video from Pittsburgh and in their um, uh, chapter of Creative Mornings, they brought in uh, a very famous drag queen named Sharon Needles to come and talk to them about her drag career and getting started in the punk rock scene in Pittsburgh and why she did what she did. And I watched it, loved it, subscribed, kept tuning into the Creative Mornings uh, talks. And then, of course, here we are now, some five years later, and it's kind of a full circle moment now that, as Stacey said, I'm now a professional drag queen, and now I get to talk about what being radical means to me. So it's kind of, for me, a full circle moment. Um, but before we really dive in, I'm going to ask, now that we've discussed what we think being radical means, I'm going to ask that we kind of take um, the political connotation that we all have, kind of the, the media like clickbait use of like the radical left or the radical right or the ra this radical like regime, kind of set that aside. That's certainly a part of it. Um, but I find that um, the true meaning of the word has a lot more depth than that. So I'm gonna refer and quote my good friend, Miriam Webster, who defines being radical as follows of or relating to the origin of something, fundamental, very different from the usual or traditional, extreme, favoring extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, or institutions, associated with political views, practices, and policies of extreme change, and advocating extreme measures to retain or restore a political state of affairs. So it's quite a lot to unpack, um, but there's a major through line that I saw. And so that was two separate definitions. Um, and one of the definitions in particular had multiple parts. Um, but the through line that you're going to see when talking about what it means to be radical or have a radical um, belief system is it's all, it all stems around the fundamental essence or origin of whatever we're discussing. Um, radical is also used literally to mean the root of something. So you constantly see when it comes to say radical change that what we're advocating for or what we're fighting for is a root change. We want to get down to the bottom of whatever issue we're discussing, whatever issues at hand and work towards fixing that, solving it and doing the best we can, but from the get go, as opposed to what we see a lot of times, what I'm sure all of us do in our day to day life, or we shouldn't, but we all do it, which is putting a bandaid over a bullet hole. That's not what being radical means um, by very definition. So the other thing I'm going to talk a lot about is change. And I'm going to use change and progress interchangeably. Um, of course, having a radical idea, you can be dramatically opposed to change. But um, for the most part, when it comes to problem solving, we're going to be talking about progress. There's a great quote that Angela Davis has that I think is the simplest way that I could explain being radical to any of the kids that I read to, which is, quote, radical simply means grasping things at the root, unquote. So we can use that simplified definition, that kind of more casual definition to kind of draw parallels to any aspect of our life. It could be artistic, grasping things at the root. It could be personal with our own lives, emotions, relationships, or it can certainly be when it comes to activism and our own political beliefs. But what, where I think the major discrepancy is, where we lose sight of the true definition and get more into the extreme connotation we have, is when you ask for radical change, for most of us, it makes us very uncomfortable. 
um, the breakout question I posed to you all was, what does it mean to you to be radical? And I posed the same question on my social media this week um, on Facebook and Instagram, just kind of in prep as I'm getting some notes together. And no one responded. <laughs> I had zero comments, zero responses. And I think that probably stems for most of us not really thinking of ourselves as being radical, or maybe it's something we don't want to be in a lot of situations. Um, because when you ask someone for radical change, it, that intense scrutiny can make someone uncomfortable because what you're asking for is a complete paradigm shift. You're asking someone to recognize that there's an issue first. And as I'm sure we're all aware of, none of us like doing that. So you have to first acknowledge that there's a problem. A lot of times it's a problem that runs way deeper or extends into many aspects of our life, probably many more than we anticipated. Recognize it, get educated on it, and then you have to completely reject that way of being, that institution or that, uh, that societal norm. Deal with the discrepancies that you're going to deal with of rejecting such a pillar you know in your life and then working through getting back to present and then continuing to progress past that point you're asking for a paradigm shift and that makes a lot of people uncomfortable so we'd rather just put the band-aid over the bullet hole what i think separates being a true radical from having a radical idea and we talked about this in my breakout uh, breakout group is you can have a radical belief but what makes you radical is putting the work behind the belief. Because so many people won't, and so many people are just content, even if something doesn't serve them, they're content with just turning the blind eye and letting society continue or letting their lives continue without asking for or fighting for meaningful change. We all do it. You can have a belief, but when you put the work behind it, especially if you're asking for such a large job to be done of you know going back and changing the fundamental origin of, of any aspect of your life that's what sets you apart because it means you're passionate it means you're dedicated um there's a a large comparison in the activist community of our work is often paralleled with the greek legend of orpheus and eurydice and uh to give you the abridged saga it's a tragedy so spoilers um but Orpheus's wife goes to the underworld and he goes to get her and he was a musician Hades refuses to let her go um, but Orpheus's music so inspires Hades wife Persephone she convinces her husband please let this girl go he says fine she'll walk behind Orpheus and if Orpheus doesn't turn around they can leave the underworld and of course as fate would have it Orpheus turns around at the last second and his wife is lost forever the point of activism of any kind, it's never to see the progress in your lifetime. My hope in what I'm doing in my literacy activism or various other political endeavors that I have is to maybe with the kids that I read to inspire that next Orpheus, that next son of a muse that's gonna try to take us out of hell. If I can just convince him to not look back, then I've done my job. I'm not Orpheus, I'm not the one in charge of not looking back. But if I can hopefully know that in the future, we're going to get through this, we're going to get out of it, then my job is done. So when it comes to being radical, there's a lot of work involved. And if you're willing to do it, if you're willing to go that far for what you believe in, then I think that's, that's the difference. You no longer have a radical belief. You're no longer, well, there's this one policy. I know it's kind of far-fetched, but I think it could be good. It's no, I'm committed to making this change. For me, I learned those skills that you're going to need to put that work behind what you believe. Um, primarily, I went to an early college, um, my seventh grade, seventh grade through my freshman year of high school. And I grew up in a very, very small town in North Carolina. It was a town of 5,000. It's called Wendell, named after Oliver Wendell Holmes, but no one in the South pronounces it Wendell, so it's Wendell. And growing up, I was very sheltered, very privileged. Um, and I, what was worse was I was ignorant to the fact that I was so sheltered and privileged. So when I first got on campus to my early college, I started meeting all these people that were more eloquent or more, in my mind, intelligent or more academic than I was. 
but by being around them, they and my teachers began equipping me with the tools of this is how you investigate, this is how you analyze, this is how you think critically and learn to ask questions and reach out and ask for help. And I was gaining these tools and I was probably 12 at the time, not really knowing what I, when I'd use them. But while I'm gaining all of this information, I'm looking around at the people that are teaching me these things and realizing as my worldview widens, these people are smarter than me and they don't have half the opportunities afforded that I have. These people are more eloquent and far more skilled and more in my mind at the time, deserving of a lot of opportunity that's not being given to them. And why is that? So for me, when those two things meshed and as I got older, when I continued fostering those relationships with my peers and continued going to those mentors, I took my passion for them and for the connection that I had with them and the, their mentorship and the hopes that I could maybe one day do that with another. I took that, put the tools they had given me behind it and said, you know, I'm going to kind of devote lots of time to putting the work in to, to make this change. And that's where I noticed there was a big difference between me and some of my peers of people who, nothing wrong with this, but maybe would turn more towards performative activism or saying something um, and believing it wholeheartedly, but maybe I don't have the time to focus on that or I can't because what will my friends think or you know, what will my family think? Um, the other thing I've noticed um, and with anything that I say today, just kind of as a general caveat, please take what resonates with you, internalize it, evolve it, um, and if I, whatever I say doesn't serve you, then just leave that be. Um, but, and of course now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but for me, even in that academic setting, as I started realizing, oh my gosh, I thought I had it hard. These people have it so much harder. I started as I got older to realize in, in a way I had always been radical and there are some of us who by no fault of our own have no choice to be anything but radical. Um, for instance, growing up in a town of 5,000 in North Carolina, I started competition dance at four. So being uh, this little feminine only child that lived on the corner of Academy and Cyprus and everyone would see him dancing around in the backyard, the society of that small conservative town was significantly altered by my little self running around and going and doing the competition dance at a Christian dance studio, I might add. Me going to the early college and being the only artist there um, in an institution that was set up primarily to help uh, students interested in STEM, it, we kind of had to shift some things around and I had to really work to find my place and it directly went against what that institution was meant to do. They weren't excluding me, but um, it, I just kind of, it wasn't meant to serve me in that way. Moving out to California and going to the San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts, I was, to my knowledge, um, the first boy to be cast in a female role in a main stage musical and I was in drag playing two roles and it was a progressive school but that was the first time in that institution's history that that had happened and I wasn't making a statement I didn't even want the roles I just auditioned and that's where they put me so for some of us you, it could be, you know, being a, a working, you know, independent single mother that goes directly against what society tells us, you know, motherhood should look like. Some of us don't have a choice but to be radical by our very existence of living our life and being out and proud about it. Other people, not so much, but that I give them all the more kudos when you can sit above certain issues and still be willing to get down to the nitty gritty of whatever particular topic is weighing on you and then agree that you're going to work towards that progress in the future. So the questions that I have been forced to ask myself as a student uh, and then just as a drag queen, particularly as a drag queen, is what do I want to do? But more importantly, why do I want to do this? And how far am I willing to go for what it is that I want? And for me, when I talk about going down to the root of, of an issue or get going down to the root of anything, 
I've talked politically, I'm sure we can all think of parallels and examples in our own life. Any political cause, whatever your top one is, you can think probably and name the origin of where it started, or at least where it started in this country, and what you need to do to continue in the way of progress. For artists, it's a little more elusive. And for creatives, because we don't deal on a logical um, or analytical plane as much, it's a lot more emotional. It's a lot more elusive what it is we're trying to attain. It can be kind of hard to know what, what am I trying to say with my art? Why, do, why am I doing this? Why do I want to do this? Or why do I put myself through this? You know, um, but when you, pinpoint what it is. And as we've seen with the Beatles, as we've seen with Maya Angelou, as we've seen with um, Tracy Chapman, as we've seen even now, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, we have artists who are using their platform, their art, and have pinpointed what it is that they want to do that goes beyond I'm good at this and goes beyond I enjoy what I do, but making sure that what they're doing matters and making sure essentially they put their money where their mouth is. They put the work behind the words. I know as an actor, if I'm working to correctly embody a character that is different from myself, then I know if I do my job correctly, maybe I can empower someone in the audience to empathize with this persona, this life, this story that maybe they wouldn't have been aware of before. And I can do that myself. And I have a radical belief that the arts are going to change the world and have the power to further encourage empathy among human beings. And I know, for instance, with my drag, if I can successfully be an example of someone who is kind and caring and literate to children, as they get older and start to hear maybe some more bigoted talking points, perhaps they'll remember there was someone in my life who is the reason that I love to read, or there's someone in my life who, showed, who taught me how to ask the proper questions. Maybe that way, okay, great. I can see, I can see as I do what I do, the direct impact of, oh, I'm here for the long haul. This is going to continue and continue. And it's, it's going beyond me and what I have to do, but it's continuing what my mentors gave to me and hopefully passing that on to someone else. Um, excuse me while I, uh, decipher my own handwriting. Um, the other thing I think, um, especially now, it's very fitting that we're all on Zoom for this uh, talk today. 2020 has given us a lot of um, curveballs and a lot of hardships and things to work through. And I'm sure if you're like me, you've been stuck at home and again, having to ask yourself what you do without just the distractions and why you want certain things and behave certain ways. Um, we, I'm sure you, if you've been on social media a lot, you've probably seen we have a lot of posts lately about the importance of self-care, um, mental health, and the importance of self-love. And kind of an influencer term, it's been used a lot, is radical self-love. And I love that term. I really do. I, I think it's used a lot, but I think ultimately what, what, it, what it's trying to convey is something that's very much needed. Um, I don't think radical self-love is just, I love myself, and if you don't like me, you know, screw you. But I, when I think, again, about that, that getting down to the root, what are we grasping at the root? What's Angela Davis, you know, as Angela Davis would say? Okay, if I'm choosing self-love, if I'm choosing that, I wanna get down to the bottom and to the very depths of who I am and what my emotions are and why I do what I do. Why do I behave this way? You know, and that's okay. Or maybe it's not, and I'm gonna, dedicate myself to myself to work through whatever issue I'm given because I've made that commitment, you know, and the same thing for self-care. It doesn't have to be face masks and, you know, manicures, although that's part of it, but it's also, okay, I'm, I'm devoting myself to caring about myself and making sure that I am being the best version that I can be and making sure that my mind, my emotions, everything's in check and I'm going to get down to the bottom of it. And I'm going to explore the depths of what that has to be. So there was an amazing, I'm actually going to check the chat because I don't want to misquote the breakout uh, group definition that I saw. I think it was from Ramel. And yes, Ramel, radical, loving yourself in a world that teaches you other. And I love that definition. And I think that goes hand in hand with 
um, that can be serve a political purpose of if you love yourself and people that are like you in a world that does not, you're, you're going to commit to making that change. But it also can go for the arts and it also can go for that self-care, self-love. So I love that kind of all-encompassing definition. So thank you for that, um, Ramel. Um, the other thing about being radical is the synonyms we see or the kind of the through line words are origin, fundamental. You see change a lot. You see um, political views, progress. These are kind of these words you see in any definition you look at, dictionary.com or Cambridge or Oxford, whatever. But one of the synonyms that came to me um, re last night after I kind of typed up my notes and everything was caring, care. When you're radical, the thing is, even if you take it to the far extreme, when you're willing to go so, so far for what it is that you believe in, um, personally, artistically, or politically, you do it, maybe not even out of selfishness, I'm sure that's part of it, but you do it because you care. Um, and a lot of times, the things that uh, would easily like, you know, medicate our own, you know, worries or fears would be that bandaid over the bullet hole. Because looking at your own problems is hard and looking at the problems in society, especially the grand scope of systems that have been in play for hundreds of years, it's really daunting. It's a lot to ask yourself to commit to doing, but you do it because you care and you're passionate about it. So when I think or call myself radical, I don't think, oh, I'm extreme. That's not where my mind goes. My mind goes, well, I care. I care deeply about what it is that I want to do and the work that I want to do. So I'm going to commit myself to make sure that that, that happens because I'm passionate about it. And again, passion is one thing, having that belief, but it's the work behind it of we're going to dig down. I love literally the word root because in my mind, when I think radical, I think of someone clawing through the soil to get to the root of this tree you know, a tree that you want to see the fruits that it's gonna bear. And you love the tree, you know, and you want other people to enjoy all the fruits of this tree, but maybe something's wrong with it. Maybe there's just something that's off and you wanna make sure that you know what it is. So you're gonna claw and claw and go through, you know, the layers of soil to get down to whatever that root is. And then put in the work to, you know, water this plant, care for it, nurture it, you know, and trees, have, oftentimes outlive us, most times outlive us. So you're gonna care for this tree hoping, maybe other people can enjoy this fruit long after I'm gone. Maybe other people, now that we've done that, we've done that groundwork, we have the foundation and the structure in play that's gonna support all of the beautiful things that say society or my art or this political party or movement can do and behold. So, for me, that's, in my observation, been how I would call myself a radical. Um, and I would hope that as we kind of move forward politically, we stop seeing the term radical being used in a derogatory way. I know with a lot of young people, um, it, it's kind of owned with pride, but more so in, um, in a rebellious way. Yeah, I'm radical. You know, I'm a radical, insert whatever their party is. But what we're seeing is, a lot of what we're asking for isn't that difficult. You know, it, it's gonna take, it might be a simple solution and it takes lots of people. It takes lots of time, but we know we're not the only ones that care about that one thing. We know that we're not the only ones that, you know, are dedicated to this cause. Oh, this is feasible. This is something that can work. So I'm hoping as we kind of move forward, we're gonna stop seeing these clickbait kind of the clickbait uses, uses of the word, and it's so far extreme and so far like, you wanna think radical is bad. Um, but in reality, it can be, it certainly can be, but more so it's, a, it's, you can be radical and have a radical way about you of how you go about your problem solving, but it's the solutions themselves that are good or bad. You wanting to get to the origin of something in order to make sure you don't repeat that mistake again, that serves everyone. That's not in and of itself bad, but it's how you're choosing to move forward that could be good or bad. And in my breakout group, um, 
So shout out to, uh, shout out to my little breakout group because we had some great little nuggets of, of gold that I wrote down so I could share. We noted that radical is, it's an interesting adjective because it, you, it can be used to describe very, very good things or very bad things. And it almost has a religious connotation, um, very similar to like zealous. It can be great to be zealous or it can be absolutely horrible to be zealous. You know, or maybe it's, not either one and it doesn't affect other people but for you and yourself you are a zealot for whatever it is you like um and radical is the same way so what i implore you all to do um if you don't consider yourself radical i'm hoping you'll start to maybe think maybe i am in certain aspects but as you go about your day your life your week whatever there are opportunities given to us where we have the ability to kind of tap into maybe that fierce curiosity that we have and never lost, but that we never really use, you know, because we don't want to know the real answer. Or maybe you can tap in to that driving ambition. And I know it's hard because I might get rejected and 2020 has been a weird year and everyone's on the job hunt or everyone's doing this, or, you know, you can tap into your more like the more frenetic passionate energies and little choices day by day and you can be radical with something subtle it doesn't have to be being an extremist but it can be dedicating yourself to what it is that you believe and knowing and promising to not only put in the work to educate yourself on the past but to put in the work to educate others in hopes that we won't repeat those same mistakes in the future so those are kind of my thoughts and observations as a, as a San Diego drag queen on what it means to be radical. Um, and I hope some of what I said resonated with you. Um, but I, I know, um, I think we can open this up for questions or if you guys have even just comments, I'd love to hear what you guys have to share. And yeah, let's, let's have some more dialogue. Absolutely. Charles, thank you so much. One of the things that you said that I uh, wrote down on my desk was being radical about caring. Uh, being radical is about caring deeply and working hard for change. And I loved, um, I loved how, how, how profound that simple message is to something that we can take to our daily life. So um, we'll open it up to questions. And um, best way to do that uh, probably is um, if you're able to raise your hand and you want to ask your question um, publicly, feel free to do that. We can monitor for questions um, from participants. Um, and if you don't do that and you feel more comfortable just asking your question in the chat, um, feel free to send a question via chat and Charles will uh, respond uh, to both. And Mike will, uh, Mike will be uh, taking over on just making sure hand raises are happening, all that type of stuff. All right. It looks like there's one question in the chat already, um, which is what helps you in, it's from Rachel, which is what helps you in the face of opposition um, or people who put you down or don't believe your power? Um, and so Rachel, for me person, personally, what it comes down to, there, I have two answers. <laughs> what I used to say as a kid growing up, my little only child, you know, precocious self, I used to say, what other people think of me is none of my business. I meant that, you know, again, in my, you know, 11 year old precocious way. Um, but ultimately for me, I say all the time, I, I don't know a lot. It just so happens that what I know, I know a lot about. Um, you can't tell me anything when I put the work in and I know that I'm educated on a subject. You can tell me a lot about computer engineering, but you can't tell me anything on theater, you know? So for me, when you know that you know, you know, when you're a perpetual student and what my education did was set me up for success and giving me the tools that I can, I'm always asking the questions and still tapping into that curiosity, like I mentioned. Um, I'm going to make sure if I'm interested in something or I want to speak on it, I educate myself enough from people that I respect enough that the opinion of someone else or opposition doesn't matter. You know, not when I know that I know, know what I'm talking about. But yeah, oh, should I be checking the, let's see, great. But yes, yeah, so that's that uh, answer. Just a reminder for everybody, if you don't know, you, there's a raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen, or uh, again, you can just toss things into the, the chat. Charles, I have a question for you. I really liked uh, your challenge to us to shift our perspective on radical from being a bad thing uh, to being a good, a good thing, because 
Uh, as we wrap this year, 2020, there's obviously been things that in my head are both good and bad from a radical perspective. Um, yeah. So I think the question is, you know, what, when you get to that point of, you know, radical being a bad thing, how do you shift your perspective? What keeps you going? Uh, how do you keep from being discouraged? Uh, and then what's that opportunity for change for you? Oh, oh my God. Okay. Um, for me, so I hope I'm answering the first question. I'm, I'm hoping I'm understanding your question that I'm answering in the correct way. Um, my own personal radicalism and what I've chosen to dedicate my life to, um, or like what I, you know, my, my work to, I never find it reaching that, um, that place of extremity, you know, maybe it's cause it's primarily dedicated to the arts and I can't get enough of them. Um, but when I'm surrounded by a just polar like extremities just outside, it could be in like a relationship or like personal life or like politics. Um, it just, it, it helps to like stay as informed as possible, but this is going to sound, I don't want this to sound apathetic, but for me, I've resolved myself to the fact I might not see the change that I want in my lifetime, you know, and that's okay. But it's celebrating those small, subtle moments of radicalism, those small, subtle wins of like, okay, you know what, maybe the perfect society that I want isn't going to materialize, but look at this great win that we have for the arts community, or look at this great win I have in local politics in San Diego, or I just had this, you know, I've worked through this in myself and now I, you know, I'm a little better at my patience. It's like finding those subtle, you know, those subtle victories or those subtle opportunities because they'll ripple, you know, and they'll overlap. And that's kind of what keeps me going because it can be very daunting when you look at like what it truly would take for like, say, a paradigm shift. <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's great. I think uh, our dance ambassador's got a, a question for you, Jordan. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to say that I really resonated with the very firm statement that at times, you know, you just don't have a choice but to be radical. It just, it is what it is. You are what you are. And yeah. it's just that. And so um, I wanted to talk about the discovery that something that was very natural to you was radical to others like have you ever have you had that type of experience and that type of uh, of awareness um and what was it like for you yes i did it's just, sorry um yes and one of the first moments so i'll just tell the story there's no other way there's no better way which is first day orientation seventh grade all boys early college or i'm in my uniform i have my tie and my blazer you know i had you know my hair cut freshly done and we had to go around and write things on other people's backs there were pieces of paper on our backs and it was all anonymous so and i got no negative things written on my back but every time i would write something on someone else's i would draw a smiley face i didn't think anything of it well to a bunch of 12 year old boys that immediately screams as i was told gay walk and I wasn't even told in a negative way, to be truth, like, to be honest, I was walking down the hallway with someone and he was like, well, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you know, you're a gay one. And I went, what? At that point, I didn't know, I didn't know I was. <laughs> what? Well, no, there's nothing wrong with it, but like, you are. Oh, okay. And then I was lucky that I had family that just kind of supported what I did and I was an only child. So I didn't have any other, um, I didn't have any ways to, to measure myself against my peers. So it wasn't until it was pointed out to me by other people in that negative way that people were, and, or that one wasn't so bad, but I've had other things, so, you know, where like, oh, my very existence is a problem to you. And realizing that I can't help it, I just figured, well, I can either lie about it and really truth be honest, truth be told, it happened a lot in my dating life. I was like, God, all these guys are passing me up. I go, okay, I can lie about myself and put on my facade and that's great. And I'll get a great date and I'm sure he'll love me. But at what point am, gonna, am I gonna have to stop lying? And then not only will he not like me because he wouldn't have liked me anyway, now he's not gonna like me because I'm a liar. So I was just like, well, I can't change it, so I might as well weed out the people that I wouldn't want in my life anyway. 
and I just I just let my very existence do the job for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, just checking out some questions in the chat, Charles. Yeah. Our good friend Cheryl's got a question. What books do you recommend for adults and also for children? Oh, um, oh my God. Okay. Um, well, you can't see. It. I'm looking at my bookcase right now. For so for children. There's different things, but I I am really I love all of the classic fantasy books. Um, I'm talking maybe more middle grade, and I think it's really important that kids have an escape. So I like your Chronicles of Narnia, for instance, or Wizard of Oz, or Alice in Wonderland. I think for me, what inspired my love of reading was that ability to escape. And kids, I, I like to honor their intelligence. You know, I know that they have their own little struggles and drama, and they want to escape that. Um, for children, small children, there's a great um, series, and I can't remember the author that I have to double check, but there's a book called Rosie Revere Engineer, and that series has similar titles about so-and-so who is a like veterinarian, or this child who is, and it's all about like kids working in STEM, and I find it really inspirational for like elementary school age. And then for adults, um, just join Reese Witherspoon's book club. I mean, I, that's what I, I'm part of there. And um, yeah, Reese Witherspoon's book club. There's just lots of great stuff. Or Oprah, you know, can't go wrong with Oprah. Nice. Um, I just want to read Bettina's comment because it's great. Your beautiful soul, Charles. The world needs more of you. Uh, oh, thank you. And then a little further up, we've got Marcy sneaking in some networking, but I think this is great. Uh, Charles, have you, would you entertain the thought of writing a book for children? Uh, Marcy's an author and would love to explore, um, you know, so, some thoughts. So, um, I have written a book for children and earlier this summer, I was on the East coast for the summer. I kind of had a lot of time on my hands. Um, so I was able to kind of get it ironed out and I started querying for literary agents and for people who don't know, before you get public, you have to get an agent first who then essentially sells your book to a publisher or, you know markets on your behalf to publishers. And I decided to stop because I really wanted to edit it and kind of pare it down and figure out more so the, the audience that I wanted. But I would love that. I could miss, it's my goal. I would love to have a Miss Una book series. I think that would be great. So um, yeah, I'd love to continue and chat some more about that for sure. Cool, yeah, I'd, I'd subscribe. Um, I got a question here from Kelly. What's one thing we can do today to invest in our radical selves? One thing you can do today to invest in your radical self. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, well, something that I try to do every day, I'll do two things. So the more broad thing, which I'll leave up to your discretion is, once a day I try to do something that makes me uncomfortable. Um, and it, it's rare that I will go out of my way to find something. Usually just some, I'll be given the opportunity and if I notice that I'm a little uneasy and it will not harm me, I'll try to do that. And I find like, it just pushes that little, like that, it, it, it stretches your, uh, your resistance to things. So like when I can go step out of my comfort zone, whatever, walking out into my backyard without shoes, you know, like, great. And little bit by little bit, there's moments where then when you're presented with the opportunity to speak up for change, you know, or like go live and talk about being radical on a Zoom call when you haven't done this in, you know, nine months, you take them. Um, and or the other thing would just be talking about self-care. I mean, it's Friday, you know, get that box of wine and a face mask. I don't know. <laughs> radical self-love right there. That's great. Uh I got a couple other questions coming in. One, who are some of your uh, moving into the realm of drag? Not that we ever left it, we are in it, but uh, yeah. who are some of your favorite drag inspirations? Uh, why? And then also, are you actively doing drag on Zoom? Where can we, where can we find you? All right, um, so, so, okay, so I'll just show, so my, my biggest idol in life in gender is Betty Davis. <laughs> She just inspires me as well as Una. But drag queens that inspire me, um, I adore um, queens. Like, I love Jinx Monsoon. I love Courtney Ack. These are theatrical queens that do live vocals. 
Um, I love one of my favorite queens is um, an older queen named Coco Peru, who's been around working since the 90s. And um, she's been on Will and Grace and done some amazing um, like work on television. And then I'm constantly inspired. Like I say, my drag persona, I'm committed to preserving a dress and decorum of decades past. So the performing artists or even aesthetics that like inspire me, a lot of them are just women, female performers, you know, the likes of like, say, Bette Midler or Betty Davis, Grace Kelly, you know, people like that. Um, Lauren Bacall, you know, any old screen siren or dame of the stage. And um, I'm not actively doing drag on Zoom. Um, I'm available. I've done some like private story readings for like homeschool groups and things via Zoom. Um, but if you follow me on Instagram uh, or Facebook or on my website, uh, I am in a Christmas show, a digital Christmas show that's going live next Thursday um, on Twitch, I believe is the website and it will be streamed there. But Anytime I do digital things, I always really promote it on um, my social media. But I just moved back to California a couple months ago, so I'm still getting settled. Awesome. Uh, Rihanna in the chat's got a question. How do you get out of your own way when it comes to embracing your uniqueness and talents? I think as creatives, we have a tendency to be incredibly hard on ourselves. What advice do you have when self-doubt comes into play? Mm, it's oh it's so hard um a couple of things for me um as creatives we are so yes we can be analytical but we are so like fueled and inspired by our emotions so when i have a negative emotion it could be sadness or anxiety or frustration if i can't do so if i'm not doing something right i i'll live in it i'll sit in it for a moment you know um not a long time so I experienced it. I think I want to experience those emotions. And then I, I really have to rely on, for me, my training. I just have to know, and I'm constantly shocked, like just when I get asked to do certain things or when I perform certain places of I shouldn't be here. And I just have to say, well, no, you've performed here, 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 here. You know, your mentor is such and such. You took classes here, you put in the work, you know. Um, that's what I do. I just, I'm like, you know, I wouldn't have gotten this far if I wasn't good enough. And also I do my art to, to entertain my damn self. So I can sound as horrible as I want. I'm not singing for other people. I mean, that helps, but I'm like, I'm going to dance and dance badly in my room or on stage. So I might as well get paid for it. Um, <laughs> that's that. And one other thing I do from, this was taken from my kind of guru acting wise and spiritually they do something called capping and it's an acronym that stands for clear accept and process so as artists it's really hard if our emotions are not in check for us to do the work that we do um because it is so emotional so at the end of every day i like to kind of take a moment take a shower deep breath clear the energy of the day and just hit restart accept what happened today, accept that performance, accept that experience that maybe triggered the doubt. Okay, that happened. I have everything I need to survive for the rest of the day. I did the performance. I can't go back in time. And then I try to process what I learned from it. And it could be, this went really well, or this went horrible, or that was fun. Um, and I do that every day. Cap, clear, accept, process. Nice. I like that. Stephanie wants to know, how did you get into children's literacy as your cause? What inspired you to go that route? Um, I kind of, it fell into my lap, really. I'm a big, avid reader, always have been. And um, my drag had really slowed down. There just aren't, there weren't at the time opportunities coming my way for the aesthetics that I had and the spaces I could get into. And I got offered the opportunity to do the drag queen story hour and previous to that i had i i'm i had done private musical theater coaching so i knew i liked working with kids um but i was offered the opportunity and after my first reading it just went so well we had so many kids there and they were all so i was kind of very impressed with how well behaved they were and engaged in reading they were that anyone that works with kids i'm sure can agree like watching kids follow along to a story or like watching kids be genuinely surprised or like genuinely engaged and wanting to know how to sound out things and like rekindled like my like oh i love reading like i love 
all being able to go places and being able to teach myself stuff and like realizing like getting to relive that and it's kind of I fell in love with that so um then it just happened no one else is doing it so I decided to do it myself that's awesome uh I think we have time for a couple other questions in case anybody has uh, one that they want to raise their hand. I got Katie uh, with a hand raised. Katie, I'm going to ask to unmute you and then you can ask away. Hi. Hi, so Katie. I, hi. I'm curious if you have any memorable or like profound moments from your experience of reading to, to kids. Oh, um, I have a lot. Uh, just on a kind. So I have very sensitive eyes that water all the time. And especially like with drag, you know, when there's glitter and lashes and glue and they just get really sensitive. So something that happens every time I read is children will ask me if I'm okay because they'll, I'll be reading and my, my eye will start to water and they'll think, like, I'll be reading like Dr. Seuss and it's like so impacting me that it's making me cry. And so I'll, I have that happen a lot. Kids ask me, are you okay? Or like, it's okay. Or, you know, don't cry. Um, but in particular, um, and I'm sure, she will end up seeing this. So shout out to Alex, who is a, the, one of the branch leaders for Drag Queen Story Hour. Her son, Henry, um, is like a dear friend of Miss Una's. And it was after the first reading that I did, the second reading that I went there, he walked all the way up to the front in the middle of me reading a book and all the kids are seated. And he stood right there, like right in front of the book. And there's a picture, I'm sure, of like, many that exist of like you cannot see the book because his head is this far and he just stands there and henry sit down and he will not budge he is so engrossed with the stories um that it's it's just it, in my mind i know like it's just henry and the book you know and nothing else in that moment and it repeatedly happening that was one of the best <laughs> awesome well i think uh one last question and i'll wrap up i'm with bill in the chat uh and he says i gotta know what's on your vision board miss una oh my vision oh <laughs> well let me show you um it's it's fair this is kind of embarrassing and fairly straightforward but my best friend gave me this um so it's divided into four sections so family goals there's just a heart um this is just kind of indicative of my friends my family just that i exist in love and kindness with them health and fitness goals i'm trying to work on those squats so i drew a peach i don't know if you could see um, um my career goals i wrote full-time queen uh prior to the pandemic i did have a day job working for a theater company which i loved but i'd love to be a full-time performer i wrote a thousand followers for una and i wrote cabaret um and i wrote uh I wrote the cabaret show that was going to be performed in March, uh, or excuse me, in uh, May, and then the pandemic happened. Travel goals is a question mark because I don't know where I'm going. And the words to live by are, act like you belong and the world is yours. So this is shout out to Jesse, my friend who gave me this. Nice, that's awesome. I think at some point in our lives, if we don't already, probably should coordinate our own versions of uh, vision boards. Uh, you know, to speak things into being, right? It's nice to see. I, I've always kind of scoffed at them and my family's big into them and I never really did that. But it's nice when I wake up and it's the first thing I see. It's across my bed. So it's the first thing I see when I wake up. And then on my, I have a vanity in front of me. I wrote cap. Just little reminders. If you can talk about inspiring, being radical. Make post-it notes, reminders on your phone. Be uncomfortable, you know, cap. Things like yeah. that. Yeah, I think it's in the chat. Cap uh yeah. clearing accepting and processing right yes and i saw that someone put my website down there so <laughs> thank you guys um and i'll even put my i can type my instagram handle so we can all stay connected and and um stay up to date with all the art that i know that we're going to be creating and all the work we're going to be doing moving forward so i'm going to type that in right now awesome yes well, I, I yeah go ahead sorry I was just going to say thanks so much for for sharing with us today. I think, you know, the really awesome thing about our community, even though we've been doing this online for nine months now, is that we're all here because we want to be. Uh, and I think your your talk this morning on Radical is a really great opportunity for us to, again, as we close this year, to really change our perspective 
uh, and think about things a little differently without getting discouraged and kind of see them as opportunities. So yeah. if we, go ahead. Oh, I was just say, I noticed also that someone had posted the, the hero's journey in the chat, which is another great mm -hmm. thing. Just in general, just read and be inspired by and um, especially, yeah, gearing up towards the end of the year. And of course, it's not Groundhog Day, so it's not like things would just get better come 2021, but just looking towards the future. Um, yeah, just taking the hero's journey, step by step, don't look back, you know? And read a good book, y'all. So uh, if we could all give everybody, uh, Charles, Miss Nuna, a big virtual clap, snap, high five. I've got yeah. Jordan, our dance jam ambassador. She's gonna play us out with some music so we can wrap this up on a high note.